got some great information, as she always does for us, and uh, I'll let her take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Well, welcome everyone. As Shelly said, my name is Jeanette Shaliga, and today we're going to be doing the D in BMD, which is about death records. Um, I got the idea of the title because I went to um, a genealogy conference, and I knew I was in the right place when I... <laughs> Uh, parked in the parking lot and there was a car next to me that had a sticker in the window that said BMD. And who else would have birth, marriage, and death sticker in their window besides genealogy people? <laughs> so, um, so we'll get started. And just right off the bat, this is, I, I don't think I've made a presentation this long before, so I'm going to talk fast to try to get through everything as I can. Um, it is being recorded, so you can rewatch it on YouTube. As Shelly mentioned, we do have a YouTube channel. We are um, Facebook Live right now. Um, and so uh, hopefully uh, we'll be able to follow everything um, as we go through. Please, though, if you do have a question, go ahead and raise your hand. So sometimes, I don't know about you, but I feel like my genealogy can be like this. Um, and hopefully today we can um, learn about some different um, death record collections that will help um, you know, answer some of those unknowns that we might have in our tree. Um, I'm going to focus on just because of where we are, you know, New York State and then particularly you know, a little bit about Western New York and Buffalo records as they kind of have a little bit of separate rules. Um, so let's just dive right in and start talking about death certificates. Um, this is a typical death certificate from the city of Buffalo in 1937. If we blow it up at the top, it's often the name of the person that's deceased, um, their residence, and um, how old they were when they passed away. On the left-hand side down the certificate is often the information that we're most wanting as genealogists because it gives us that personal information. Um, you know, what did they, what was their occupation, how long did they live in this area, and then especially, what were their parents' names, where were, where were the parents born, where, where was the person that passed away born, um, so we always tend to like that, that section of the death certificate. On the right-hand side of the death certificate in this particular case, this is the medical um, information the cause of death and the doctor that um, signed off on when the death occurred. And then at the bottom is cemetery and funeral information. Um, and so you can use that to help you find where the person is buried because oftentimes our family members are buried together in the same family plot. Um, and so that can help you find other people that may, you may not have known were buried there because maybe they didn't have a headstone. So ask at the cemetery office. So, death certificates are kind of a unique document in that they can have both primary and secondary information on them. The primary information is often the medical side of it, where the doctor um, witnessed the death or shortly thereafter witnessed the death. Um, and so because it was recorded near the time of the event, um, it is considered primary. Secondary information is more of that information that we really want as genealogists. Um, the, the place of birth, the date of birth, the name of the parents. But a lot of times we're not sure who's giving that information because it's not the person that passed away. They weren't saying I was born on this date. It's someone else giving that information. So that is considered secondary. So if we're going to look at an example, as I said, about primary information, um, so this is the side of the death certificate where the um, you know, doctors um, said that I hereby certify I attended the deceased from this date to this date and that I last saw her alive at this date and um, the death occurred at this time due to these reasons. And so for those of us that are curious about medical um, our medical family history, you know, getting a death certificate might help you research that line. For examples of secondary information, we're going to find that mostly in the personal and statistical per, um, areas. And so the first step is to check out who the informant is. And so if you look at the bottom, at the bottom, the informant for this death certificate was her nephew. So therefore, the the dates and the names it says right above he signed. 
uh, right above where he signs, it says, the above stated personal particulars are true to the best of my knowledge and belief. Mm -hmm. But he wasn't born, you know, he wasn't even alive when she was born, so he didn't witness her date of birth. He may or may not have ever met her parents. It doesn't mean it's not true, but it's secondary information, and secondary information isn't always as reliable as primary information. So if we get another example here, this one just kills me. So um, Barbara passed away, and her husband, John Hetzel, is the informant. And when it asked who was Barbara's parents' names, he gave the dad's name, Michael Golitzer, but the dad had died like 11 years before they were married. For the mother's name, he wrote unknown. She lived with them for almost 20 years. <laughs> Come on, you don't know your mother-in-law's name. She lived in the house with you. Oh my goodness. I don't know, it's just because they want to drive us nuts. Now, we can't get mad at everyone. In this example for Nellie, um, it says her parents are unknown, unknown. Um, and that was actually correct because um, she was um, raised in an orphanage. So she didn't know who her parents are. So we can't, can't immediately go, come on, why didn't you give me that information? There might be reasons behind it. And then I was looking for an example where I actually thought that this side of the um, death certificate might actually be primary. In my family, there was a young man that passed away when he was like 15 or 16 years old. Does that say 15? 15 years old. I thought maybe his mother would be the one that, you know, gave the information. Now, she would have been primary because she was there at the birth when she gave birth to him. However, she's not the one that signed it. Um, so I thought for sure Caroline would be the person that would have signed at the bottom, but this person, Ruth Miller, um, or Mueller did, um, and it said her address was 462 Grider. And I was like, well, maybe that was a neighbor, and Caroline was too distressed at the time to fill it out. And another thing that kind of piqued my interest is that Caroline's last name wasn't Gardner. It was Ogrodnik. And... Uh, interesting side note, in Polish, Ogrodnik means gardener. I don't know <laughs> if that was a, a correlation or if it's just wrong information and a coincidence. Um, and so I was thinking, like, well, maybe this Ruth was a friend. She was at the hospital. I'm, I'm fabricating all these reasons. And then I look at the other side of the death certificate where the doctor signed it, and then I noticed the 462 Grider again. This is a good reason why you should always transcribe the things. And I'm like, huh, but this doctor has a different last name than the, me not knowing where it is. This is where ECMC is now. This is the hospital. <laughs> um, so the, a nurse or a hospital staff was the informant for the um, certificate. So sometimes if you get really stuck too and you start seeing clues like that, um, maybe Google the address and it might go, duh, <laughs> like it did for me that, you know, the hospital was the informant in this case. So I didn't actually have an example to give you where the primary person um, could have given that first-hand knowledge um, being the informant. Um, so again, I'm going a little fast tonight. Are we good on death certificates up to this point? Just kind of reviewing what they are. Awesome, I see head nods. So I'm going to go kind of quickly um, and give us an overview of um, New York State in the vital records. Um, and I wanted to kind of say that I'm getting this from two places. And the one is right on your handout. The first place is the Family Search Wiki. Okay, and this is how you get to the wiki. You go to the help and you go down to the research wiki and um, how to find New York death records. There is a huge article with hyperlinks that will take you to record collections that you can search right in there. And um, the name of this is in your handout. The second place where I'm getting our timeline from is the um, New York GNB um, Guide and Gazetteer. It is a two volume, I'll come back. <laughs> it is a two volume set. Um, and in the first volume, chapter two is all about the vital records in New York. Um, it's for $90 if you're a member. It is um, $25 off, so $65. 
But if that still is too much and you just want the chapter on the vital records, you can order that separate where they've extracted that information out. And um, that's for 20, what, $23.95, but members can get it for $19.95. So those are the two places where I'm receiving this history from that I'm sharing with you. So we'll start with the first area, which was before 1847, and no deaths were recorded. <laughs> um, you, so they suggest that you try substitute records, such as cemeteries, newspapers, probates and wills, taxes, um, uh, church uh, census, and Bible records. I went for, to look for an example. I kind of did a historical cemetery in Lockport in Cold Springs Cemetery came up and I just kind of started, so I, I put, you have to put in a name, otherwise you have to scroll through the whole thing. So I put in William because I figured that was a pretty safe name. And I did find that they do have stones with dates carved in back, you know, this one was um, 1843. So you can find cemetery stones surviving um, for the, before this time frame. The next time frame is between 1847 and 1850. They passed a law calling an act providing for the registry of births, marriages, and deaths. It required doctors, midwives, and clergymen to report the births, marriage, and deaths to the local school districts. They were also supposed to provide duplicates um, to the Secretary of State. Um, this law was widely objected to because it was complex and they couldn't execute it. Um, and though it wasn't officially repealed until 1885, pretty much everyone stopped doing it after a year. Um, but these may be out there. You might be the lucky one that was recorded during this time frame. Um, the, they've been, the ones that they've been able to find, they have transcribed them. Um, the Central New York Genealogical Society has transcribed some of them and put them in their tree talks, which is their newsletter that um, is separated out by county, and we have them upstairs in our library. Come visit our library Thursday, Friday, and Saturdays, 1 to 5, upstairs. Um, and, you know, uh, and it has been microfilmed and indexed in other places, but you might get lucky during this time frame. Um, the next time frame is 1851 to 1879, and there were a few other laws that they tried to pass to get people to record these vital records, but some were repealed like the next year. Um, again, people didn't listen to it. They just couldn't get compliance. Um, so Brooklyn started recording their own deaths in 1862 successfully. And then shortly thereafter, um, the New York City's Metropolitan Board of Health was created in 1866. And so 1866 marks the date in which vital records in New York City were officially started to be kept. In the same time frame, according to the New York um, Guide and Gazetteer, other cities around New York State um, started to become impatient with the state not being able to get out a law that the death, you know, and that these vital records were being kept. So they started um, maintaining their own records. Albany started in 1870, Yonkers started in 1875, and Buffalo, our local big city here, um, began in 1878. So they held those records themselves. So if you're looking for deaths, um, you have to, and you can see in the screenshot below from the Family Search Wiki, it says where you need to order them from. So if you're looking for Buffalo, um, death records for the 1878 to 1914 time period can be ordered from the Buffalo Register or Vital Statistics. That's where they are held. The same for Albany and Yonkers. Then in our next time frame is 1880 to 1913. And this is really considered the modern era of when the vital records were starting to be kept in New York State. Um, in 1880, New York State created a Board of Health and a Bureau of Vital Statistics. And in June of 1880, they passed a law which required all the villages, towns, city registers to record the deaths. Copies of these deaths were also supposed to be filed with the State Board of Health in Albany. Now, New York City was already doing their own, and Albany, Buffalo, and Yonkers were already doing their own, so they were exceptions to the rule. This rule applied to the rest of the state except for those four places. Um, so they did not have to send copies to the, um, to the state in Albany. They held them their own. 
Um, so although 1880, 1881 is the official start date for when these vital records were um, starting up, it was real slow and uneven um, for it to happen again. Um, so um, our government kept passing additional laws to further encourage these local municipalities to comply, or the officials could be um, charged with misdemeanors, fines, and even imprisonment. They were getting annoyed. They're like, we want these vital records. And um, it took them over 30 years to actually get everyone on board um, to send these in. So some people, even though 1880 was the true start date that the law was passed, you send us your, you know, those vital records, didn't actually start really going into effect um, until like um, 1913, and there's still kind of like a two-year time frame that they really truly believe that it didn't start until like 1914, 1915 in that area, where they started to feel that all of the events were truly recorded. So that brings us to this 1914 to 1956 era. Um, and so everyone, Buffalo, Albany, Yonkers, everyone but New York City was now sending all of their copies to Albany. Okay, so all, um, Buffalo for us was no longer holding them locally. They were, they were sent, and yes, they still held a copy locally, but they were also sending um, a copy to Albany. So um, they um, were filed with the New York State Department of Health, um, and you know, so things started, the modern era has really begun now. And then the uh, next little time frame is 1957 to 1969. And this 1969 year is a moving year. Um, it's because it's 50 years prior to us. So next year, this, this, if I was giving this presentation again, my slide would say 1957 to 1970, um, because um, then it would be 15 years away. Um, the New York State Department of Health published um, a genealogical research death index that you could look up a person's um, date of death, where the death occurred, and um, the certificate number that's on file with them. They update it quarterly, so you don't have to wait, as I was mentioning, for it you know, to move to 2020. Um, quarterly, they'll release new information into that index, and you can find it um, at their website, which I will show you a little. No, I won't show you. That was a slide that didn't make the cut. Um, <laughs> if you do a Google search for the New York State Department of Health, and you um, look for the um, genealogical research death index, that's there. But you don't necessarily have to go searching for that because Ancestry copied it, and it's on Ancestry, it's on Family Search, it's other places, but they got it from them, okay? Lastly, to finish our time frame would be 1969 to the present. New York State has a law that um, a death certificate must be on file for 50 years before it was released for genealogical purposes. So as I said, 50 years back from now would be 1969. Now, there are exceptions to the rule, and according to their website, it can be waived for direct line descendants, um, meaning a child, grandchild, great-grandchild, etc., um, but you have to have proof of your relationship to that person that you're requesting. Um, you have to have proof of the death, um, if you're requesting a birth certificate, and proof um, of the death of both spouses if you're requesting um, the marriage certificate. So they just want to make sure that you truly are you know, um, a next of kin in line for that record. So... I know I'm going fast, so just a quick sum up of brief history. And if you were like, holy cow, I didn't get any of that, if you just read that wiki page that I told you, it's all right on there. Um, so before 1847, not really going to find vital records. There's a very slim chance you might find a record between 1847 and 1850. Between 1851 and 1879, some places tried to keep records for a little bit, but it wasn't that successful. 1880 starts the official date, but people didn't really start officially complying until 1914. But lucky for us, if you have family that lived in Buffalo, Buffalo started in 1878, so you might find it there. 1914 to 1956, our modern era has begun. All events should have been recorded. 
And then there was that special index between 1957 and 1969 um, where they released the death certificate numbers. And then 1969 to the present is just the last 50 years where unless you're a direct line descendant, you're going to have to wait for that 50 years to pass for the death. I'm talking fast. How are we doing? We're, we're good? I'm seeing nods. Any questions? Awesome. Okay. So let's talk about the Department of Health. Um, they, when they got to those um, records, they needed to make an index so that they could find their things. Um, and so they had records starting back from 1880, and they released the, the index on microfiche, those little cards. And they gave a set of them to 11 locations across New York State. So you had to drive to one of those 11 locations. For us, the closest was the Grosvenor Room at the Buffalo Public Library. And you had to give them your license, and then they'd give you the one sheet of microfiche, and then you had to figure out how to use the machine and, like, zoom in and then read the tiny, tiny little print. Um, and so this is what it looked like, but don't worry, you no longer have to drive to Buffalo, you no longer have to give your license up for a couple minutes, because thanks to Reclaim the Records, they have gotten these records, um, a copy of them, uh, free and available to the public. Um, they, they have taken New York State to court three times, I think, at this point. Um, and uh, sometimes New York State gives over the records freely, sometimes they have to fight a little bit more. Um, so they started with low-hanging fruit, and they're like, this is just an index. It's not the certificates. We just want to know what the file name is and if you have when the person died so that I can order that certificate. Don't you want my $22? You know, kind of. Um, and so... Um, what's nice about this, too, is versus going back to the um, library and getting that microfiche, this is actually a better image because when they got a copy, they got it from the master versus the one where all of us put our fingers on it and touched it and scratched it and who knows how long they were sitting there at the libraries. So if you haven't learned a little bit about Reclaim the Records, I highly encourage you to go to... Um, YouTube, they have a channel where they have the founder has given a couple presentations and she gives a history of how it got started. And it's just fascinating to listen to. She strongly believes that we as citizens pay taxes and these records are ours and they should not be kept behind a wall. And goodness gracious, what if there was a fire and those records are lost? They should be digital and freely open to everyone. So when um, Reclaim the Records uh, wins cases they um and they also on their website tells you where they are in the litigation process with certain record groups they then post um all the records that they get for free for everyone to um use on archive.org okay so that's where you can go for these but they don't mind um they family search and ancestry also then uses them, indexes them, and puts them on their website. They do wish that Ancestry would give them more credit um, <laughs> for, for doing it. Um, Family Search puts right on there, this it, um, record collection was given to us thanks to Reclaim the Records. You know? um, so if you go to archive.org, you can look at the images. Um, but you don't have to at this point because many of them, as I said, have been downloaded and then indexed by Ancestry and Family Search and put up on their sites. So you can just type in your name, hit search, and then the results pop up for you. So let's take a look. Um, as I said, the New York State Department of Health started keeping an index every year of the deaths from 1880. Um, and so this one, uh, Family Search. They have it on there. It was last updated on the 20th of August, um, and they have 4,749,222 names listed on there. So 4,700,000 New York citizens that have died are listed on that death index. When you click into the collection, um, you just put a person's name in that you're searching for. I put in Nellie Larkin and then hit search. I didn't even include any other information. It's not needed. And I got 70 hits and she was in the first couple. Um, after so many, it started giving me 
other names that were similar to Nellie, like Ellen and things like that, that they thought maybe might be there. And then you can see the date of death and where, which I knew that that was mine, Nellie, because she died on that date in Buffalo. And then over here, this thing that looks like a document, that's just the transcription. That's the index, okay? You want to actually, it's always best to look at the actual image. You want to click on the camera. And when you do, I did two kind of screenshots here. One where it shows the top. Um, so it's organized by a sound X code, the name of the decedent, the place of death, the age, the date of death, and the state certificate number. And then there's my Nellie. And it's got her state certificate number right there. So I know Albany has a copy of her death certificate. That same collection is right at Ancestry. Similar, similar searching and everything like that. Um, however, may I encourage you guys to always, if you are going to do a search in Ancestry, scroll down and read where it says about the New York um, Death Index. Now, their numbers are different. Okay, it should be 1880 to 1956 because that's the range that Reclaim the Records got because the New York State Department of Health said started keeping that list in 1880. So if you read a little bit into the fine print, it says death records from Albany, Buffalo, and Yonkers were locally held until 1914. Records from Buffalo and Albany have been added, but not Yonkers. So um, Family Search decided, hey, I'm going to just keep the, the Department of Health's index its own collection. And Ancestry went, most people are just going to, like, just, I want all the New York State deaths in the same collection. I just want to type in the name once. I don't want to have to go to each different collection to see if my person was in there. So they combined three record collections into one collection. Okay, so there's Albany, Buffalo, and the Department of Health ones. And so Buffalo had started keeping some deaths. I know their official date was 1878, but they do have some back to 1852. So that's why Ancestry says that their collection starts in 1852, but it's misleading because it's just a small amount of Buffalo records. It's not the whole state, does it? If you had just looked at the title, wouldn't you think, this is awesome, I have somebody that died in Rochester in 1860, and then you get disappointed when you can't find their name in there. So make sure you go scroll down and you read that fine print. Um, I did a search for Nellie just to see if the results would come back similar that they did at Family Search, and it sure did. I, they only gave me 11 search results. They didn't give me too many different um, alternate names. They kind of their their search results were more specific. And then I clicked on the um, icon to view the image, and it's the it's the same, slightly different quality. But it's the same. So the New York State Department of Health, we've already gone over um, the restrictions that a death certificate needs to be on file for at least 50 years. Um, Nellie died in 1940, so we're past that restriction. I knew her certificate number, so if I wanted to order a copy of her death certificate from the state, um, I would go to the Department of Health's website. And on the left, you can see like birth certificates, death certificates, then you go to the one where it says genealogy records and resources. Oh, I clicked the wrong way. There we go. So they want um, some money to give you this certificate. And they say, if you know the date, um, it's $22. But if you're not sure of the date, if you give us a range between four to 10 years to look, we're gonna charge you $42. If you're not sure of the date from 11 to 20 years, we're gonna charge you 62. And if you're just not really sure what century, um, for 81 to 90 years, you can pay $202 and have them, you know, do a search of that extent. Um, so it's always better to get the results quicker, the more and most clear information you can give them. So if you know the date of the death, put it on there and put the certificate number two. You know, we want them to kind of get these certificates out to us, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so as much as you can with the accurate information, um, provide it on the form. So this is what the form looks like. It, it's right on the website. You can fill it out. It's a nice PDF. You can just type right in it and then print. Um, and so the form to request um, a genealogical <coughs> record is called the DOH 4384. 
Um, what's nice about it is you can put more than one on there. Um, it has two fields for birth, two fields for marriages, and two fields for death. Um, and then at the bottom, you know, for what purpose is this information required? I just put genealogy, you know, and then uh, what is your relationship to the person? Um, you know, again, I would put like second great granddaughter or something. In what capacity are you acting? And I put genealogy again. Um, and then you sign it and give them your check. Now, hmm, hope you guys aren't in any rush <laughs> to receive these certificates because right on their website is saying that processing a genealogy request may take eight months or longer um, to receive it. If you happen to know the municipality where the death occurred or the marriage or you know, whatever you're after, we suggest you go there first. Um, you'll probably get it quicker. Um, you might save, as they say, save considerable time. So Barbara introduced me just a couple weeks ago. I did, not, I did not know that there was a Facebook group. It's a closed group for New York State genealogy. So if you um, aren't in that group, you might want to request in. And they have a file that they keep. So if you look at the page, you can click on files. And um, it is a wait time for vital statistics. And what that is is that um, Barbara can be like, hey, guys, I ordered a birth certificate um, on September 25th, 2019. And then when she gets it, she writes them again and says, hey, guys, I got it. And then they can mark how long it took for you to get that record. And so they've been collecting this information for some time now. Um, and so they're able to map out some um, statistics. And so they said that they did a FOIL request and that um, for the uh, last full year available, which is 2017, the Department of Health processed 5,104 genealogical requests. This translates to about 19.6 certificates processed per day based on 260 workdays per year. Um, one can estimate by the output that the state had approximately one head count or less assigned to the tax. Then they said um, the average wait time for mailed requests in 2018 was 261 days, which is 8.7 months. Um, this was up from 2017, where the average wait was 211 days, which is 7 months. Um, the shortest time in 2018 was 63 days. The longest clocked in at 343 days, which is 11.4 months. Now, on the list, and there was nothing I could really do to like show this to you cleanly, so I tried to break up the boxes. So across the top, it says the type of request. Were you requesting a birth, marriage, or a death? Um, has it been completed or is it pending? Then the name of the person that requested it. How they requested it? Did they drop it off? Did you mail it? Um, uh, what is the date you requested it? Um, numbers of years searching. You know how I said if you, you could pick the 81 to 90 year frame? All of the people, this is just one, 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 everyone that requested knew the date that they wanted. It was within one year. Um, did you include the certificate number, the state certificate number that we found on the indexes? Most of them are all yeses. And then up in the top in this first box, date it was completed, and then how many days did it complete the request? So you can see 313, 313, and then there's some shorter ones. I'll talk about that in a second. These are days. 308 days, 306, 302, 334, 408, 523 days. Now the ones that are shorter are because they dropped them off right there. They didn't mail them in. People that drop it off, so if you're in Albany, drop it off, you're going to get a much quicker result because they got theirs back in 56 days. Now, scrolling down on the list, these are ones that are pending, um, and the, there's people waiting from January of 18 that still haven't received it. Now, maybe that person did receive it and forgot to tell the list people that they got it in, maybe, but the list is so long, it makes me nervous because here's my request from May of this year. There's people from 2018 waiting gosh, I've got a while to go yet before mine are going to get there. So the guy on the um, Facebook group had said, you know what, contact your legislator. And I kind of took that to heart. Um, I, <laughs> I, I feel that this is a little unreasonable considering that I sent them $110, and if I did, how many else in here have you ever requested from, okay, 
So we've, yeah, we've all sent them money. They're making $22 a certificate. I gave them the date of death and the certificate number. Can't take that long to get it done. I feel that they don't have enough manpower. And so I did. I sent an email to Mike Norris, our assemblyman, just saying, please understand I'm not asking for mine to be put to the top of the pile. I'm asking for light to be brought to this, you know, and saying, hey, maybe instead of only accepting these requests by mail, maybe if we did it digitally, you know, like that would maybe speed the process mm -hmm. up or maybe they're undermanned and they need more staff. He hasn't written me back yet, but I'll let you know. <laughs> It'll take 342 days. <laughs> How long ago did you write that? Just um, actually last weekend. So <laughs> it hasn't been that long. But I, I, I am curious um, if he will respond, what the response will be. Um, and I will share that with, with you guys. Yes? Can you post your request on the Facebook group? I guess I could. I told them that I did it because um, he had suggested, you know, please contact your Congress, your assemblymen, your legislators. Um, and so they said, oh, let us know when you hear back. And so I, I will. Um, I tried to make mine not, you know, I'm not telling them my whole life story, but enough, you know, to show them why I think, you know, my, my concerns about it um, and why I want it. Um, and so, if I may just one more time suggest, just like the State uh, Department of Health, it's, oh, Kathy, you're going to set off the alarm? Uh, yeah, go in there. Okay. <laughs> this way. <laughs> There's the restrooms over here. <laughs> um, so, contact the local municipalities first. Um, you're going to have much better luck. Um, it's less expensive and much faster than ordering from the state. The only downside of it is Family Search says is, the individual clerks may not be aware of the state law saying that we are allowed to have these if a record has been on file for more than 50 years. We don't need a certified copy. We don't need it stamped or sealed. We need a genealogical copy, and we are allowed to have that. Um, the pros of ordering from the state is that for the same price, they will cover one to three years, whereas a local clerk might be like, you tell me the date, and that's it. I don't have time to go searching you know, around. Um, but a con from ordering from the state could take more than eight months. Um, okay, so my second great-grandfather died in 1958, and I found his certificate number on the Genealogical Research Death Index. This was before Ancestry and Family Search had it. So I had his date of death, I had where it was, and I had his certificate number, and I knew where it was because the 1401 code meant Buffalo. So I tried to go to my local municipality. Back then, it was only $10 to order from the city of Buffalo, and I got this nice letter saying, hey, we looked, thanks for the 10 bucks, but we couldn't find your certificate. And I'm like, oh, so I did. I filled out my request, and I sent it to Albany, and eight months later, I got the certificate, and it had the right number on it that matched exactly what was on the list. Um, but what, you know, makes me wonder is, it says the place of death was in the city of Buffalo. Why Buffalo didn't have it, I'm not sure. Okay, maybe they just lost it. Um, yeah. It's because it's at the Buffalo State Hospital. So they didn't have them Those, at... those particular death records mm -hmm. are, like, in a separate place. And you physically have to tell them, no, mm -hmm. it's a psych center record. Interesting. It's, Thank it's you. It's different because I've, I've had that happen many, many times, and you know, and it's like, no, really, they're in a, go look again. They're in a separate place, and I always got no, really. I want my I ten dollars in eight months back. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So no, that's great yeah, that's to know. Why. Yeah. Um. So thank you, Janice. But a lot of the clerks won't know that. Mm -hmm. And I've had to tell them repeatedly sometimes, no, really. Well, and I didn't really know that he place. died there either until yeah. I received the certificate. Yeah. But it's nice that it's located in two spots. In case place A can't find it, then Albany might have a copy of it too. So it's nice to have a backup. I have seen too where they, uh, instead of listing the hospital, they'll say 400 Forest. And that's yes. the other giveaway for Buffalo State mm -hmm. Hospital is 400 Forest Avenue. Great. Good advice. Like I said, I didn't know where he had died. I knew it was in Buffalo. but So now... The reason why I wrote our assemblyman is because I am trying to join the Mayflower Society. And Mom's been helping me. We've been working real hard. 
And I'm stuck on, or I was stuck on where great grandma Gammy, where Ella died. <laughs> Um, she was in that genealogical research on um, the death index thing, um, but it just said place of death, death place, New York State. It didn't give a where. I checked her obituary. It, did, it said where she resided, but it didn't say where she died. I had the funeral home. Um, no, I'm not sorry, not the funeral home. I had the cemetery information, but there was no information there where she died. And I thought about contacting the funeral home. Maybe they had in their old records. You know, I started really thinking, where can I find this? In fact, I was talking to Janice about it two weekends ago. I'm like, where can I find this? I even have her will, and it says in her will um, that she died in the city of Buffalo. Okay? Went to Buffalo. They said they don't have it. They don't have the record. They checked and checked. They didn't have it. I want to join the Mayflower Society. Um, and so... I just, the boat. Yeah. Um, so I started thinking about who can I talk to, and yeah, don't ruin my joke. Um, who can I talk to that might still know where Gammy died? And I started thinking about down her tree. Who's still alive down her tree? And at the bottom um, is Aunt Dot, and Aunt Dot has a daughter, Pat. Um, and I haven't talked to her in a little while, but I was like, I'm going to call Aunt Pat and see if she knows. And so I called her, and I explained about how the wait time for New York State is, is well over a year, and I'm trying to join the Mayflower Society because next year in 2020 is the 400th anniversary of when the boat came in 1620. And so if I have to wait for New York State to get me the death certificate, I'm literally going to miss the boat. Um, and so it's killing me that I can't get... I can't get this death certificate from New York State. I ordered it back in May, you know, but I'm, I'm going to miss it. And so she thought real hard, and she's like, well, she had had a lot of strokes, and she was at the Erie County Home and Infirmary, which is in Alden. And so I emailed the Alden town clerk, and within days, I had it for a dollar. Okay? Not the $22 that I sent off to New York back in, in May that I'm still waiting for. Um, but so please, please, please check the local municipality. And if you're, if you're not having luck, try different strategies of different who might know where that person died. Try the funeral home. Try the cemetery. Look and see if you can't figure it out because it's going to save you so much time and probably money too. Um, to help you get that. We're good so far? Any questions? How are you doing? Not bad. Okay. All right. So, unfortunately, New York State is not like Pennsylvania where they release their certificates online. Like, because if you're on Ancestry and you have any Pennsylvania people, you might have gotten some of the death certificates uh, came up as hints. Um, so, therefore, in New York State, we have to rely on those indexes um, to help us locate where the death might have occurred so that we can find that local municipality or order it from the state. Um, and so thanks to Reclaim the Records, a lot of those indexes have been released, um, and they are actually trying to get their first actual records now. Um, not just an index, but they're trying. They're, they're going to see if, it, if it'll happen. They're like, we don't need certificates. We don't need seals. We just want the paper. We just, you know, like it doesn't need to be official. We just want a copy of the paper. So fingers crossed on that. You can search on your handout. I gave lots of different places in Family Search and Ancestry of different collections that you might um, find um, death records in. And even though it looks like I sometimes put a comma and didn't put a comma, that's not me. That's how Ancestry has it. And so in order for that title to come up perfectly, you might want to copy it how exactly how I typed it. But you can always just do some searching on your own in the card catalog just by putting death and then you can filter down to like birth, marriage, and death collections. I want it just in uh, the United States. I want it um, just in New York. And you can narrow down and you can see all the different collections that Ancestry has on death records in New York State that you might need to find you know, or that you can search in because not all of these are in the shaky leave hint things. Okay, you, if you're like, no, I don't have to do any researching in the catalog because they just give me these shaky hints, that's not how it works. You have to actually go take these books off their shelf and look to see if your ancestor is in them. 
One thing I love about Ancestry is this past year, how they came out with my tree tags. Um, this beta feature, I think, is now out of beta. Um, but you can add labels to um, people. And so if I had um, a stack of sticky notes, and um, you're all my family tree, and I could be like, you died young, and you um, married three times, and you didn't have any children, and you worked on the railroad, and like, you know, I can start tagging, and I can give people multiple sticky notes, okay? I can say, you're my direct ancestor, you're a DNA match, you know, all these things. Well, one thing, um, you can create custom tags. Um, so if you click on the, the blue um, tag icon, it'll bring up this panel on the right. And then you can create a custom tag. And I've created ones um, to help me get my act together, such as people I haven't ordered death certificates for. And so I created a custom tag, death certificate needed, and then you can start adding it to people, and then you can search your tree, and then um, if you click on filters and you select death certificates needed, the, the custom tag that I had, at the time I took this, this um, is a little bit older, I've gotten some of these, um, it said that I had 15 people um, that I, didn't, I don't have death certificates for. And you might be like, well, I, do I really need to spend $22? I have the obituary. I know when they die. A couple lessons I've learned through doing this is, one, prices go up. So later, if you want to order them, <laughs> if they may not, you know, I, I, why I didn't order all these death certificates when they were $10 and now I'm paying $22 is driving me nuts. And then secondly, they are considered primary information versus secondary. You know, that obituary clipping, the people at the newspaper weren't there at the death but the doctor was there at the death when they made the death certificate. So it's better genealogical um, source. It's a better genealogical source for you. So you can use those um, tree tags to help you organize your people on your tree to help you see which certificates you need. Okay. Are the uh, tree tags available for people with a free account or does it have to be a paid account? Hmm. Good question. I'm not sure that I know the answer to that. So try it if you don't have a pay account. And if it works, great. If not, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> so good question. Um, so for New York State, we really want to use those indexes to help us find the place of death and the date of death. Try to locate the local municipality. And then order the death certificate. It's a good primary source. Um, also, just another recap, don't forget to read about the collection on Ancestry or Family Search, where it says more about this or read more. Find out what's in that collection to help you understand, you know, like when that, that Ancestry one that said 1852 to 1956 is kind of a false title. Yes, they have records from 1852, but not all of New York State. So read that information to help you understand the collections. Good? Good? Okay. Social Security Death Index is another index. This one's been out for a while. Um, and so this is, um, clipping is from MyHeritage. Um, so when a person passes away, their Social Security number becomes invalid so that they can release the um, date of death because the Social Security number can't be used again. Um, and so where this comes from is someone will apply for Social Security, and they fill out a form that's an SS-5. Now, I know this isn't a death record, but I wanted to understand where the death index came from. And so this is an example of an SS-5. It's a really great genealogical resource because the person that completes it fills in their parents' address or parents' names with mother's maiden name. Um, and so it is a great resource to order. And just a little side off of the death records for a minute, how you order that SS-5 is you go to the Social Security, um, you can just Google Social Security um, and then the Freedom of Information Act. And then you can, um, to request a person's SS-5 where they apply for Social Security, the form you need to fill out is the um, SSA-711. It's right there on the site though. It's pretty easy to do. You click on it. Um, I'll go back to that screen in a second. Um, it costs $24. Um, if you 
want the photocopy. Um, and it's the same price if you can give them the Social Security number and if you don't give them the Social Security number, it's the same price. They do have some restrictions though. To get an SS5, they will sometimes redact the parent's information if they feel that the parent could still be living. So read their fine print on um, how long it can be. The number holder, the Social Security number holder, must be at least 100 years old. Um, or I'm sorry, number holders, are, oh, you have to have proof of death if, for 100 years or 120 years if um, you don't have proof of death. To fill out the forms, you just fill it out online. You put their name, you put their parents' name, you put your name, and give them your credit card, and you hit submit. Okay, now we're back to deaths, but I just wanted to help because it's a really good, it's a really good document to get for your family tree. So talking about obituaries, isn't this fun? Like who else is like, well, I'm going to go learn about obituaries tonight. Yes. Do you remember, do you remember okay. Father? Yes. Okay. okay. <laughs> no interruptions. Okay, so um, this one is from uh, the Wellsboro Agitator. Um, in February 20th, 1895. It says, Mrs. Eliza Harding, widow of the late Josiah Harding, died last week Saturday at the home of her daughter, Mrs. A.J. Preston, in Covington Borough. She was 74 years of age. Six of her 13 children are still living. She was a woman of rare intelligence and sweetness of disposition. So, um, it says, on Wednesday the 20th, she died on Saturday. Um, or actually it says she died last week Saturday. Um, you might not know sometimes how often a newspaper is published. I happen to find this one on Ancestry. It's pretty easy for me to look at because you can see the only, on the calendar here, the only dates you could click on was every Wednesday. So that kind of gives me a hint that this was a weekly publication. But then also, you can always compare the title page. So the one on the top is the 20th where I got her obituary, and it says volume, what is that, 17, number 8. And then I went to the week before on the 13th, and you can see it says volumes, uh, no, is that, it's not 17. XL 40, help me out, 42? No, IL? No, XLII. Oh, 42. 42. 42 number 8, and then the other one is the week before, it's 42 number 7. I have an app that tells me that. I don't know. <laughs> so I, it's, it's obvious that these were printed every Wednesday, these articles. But there's a little trick. There's a website called um, stevemorse.org, um, and it's his one-step uh, kind of shop kind of thing where you can search immigration records, census records. He's got a whole bunch of stuff on there. Um, and one of them is on there is the perpetual calendar. And what you can do is you can put the year um, and month and it will tell you what dates that happened in that month at that time. And so if the newspaper was published on the 20th and they said she passed away on Saturday, you know, the Saturday before, Therefore, I can determine that she passed away on February 16th. So that's just a little hint on figuring out um, some of the newspaper things. Now, you might see some other words that you're not familiar with. In this um, obituary, it says at the beginning, Mr. Josiah Harding, who died in Covington on the 25th, Ultimo, at the age of 80 years. Um, that's Latin for the last or previous month. So if this newspaper was published September 5th, he died August 25th, because it says 25th Ultimo. So the last month would be August if it came out in September. There's also Latin in this one. Um, Mr. S.G. Harding, age 67, uh, of Covington, was badly squeezed between a wagon and the rear wall of Brighton's store in Wellsboro recently. Died at the Blasberg Hospital on the third instant as um, the result of his injuries. So instant is Latin for now, immediate, or current month. So if his if this newspaper came out August 15th, he died on the third of this month, third of August. Okay. Ancestry has an obituary collection um, that ranges from 1930 to current. 
Um, it has over 178 million names, but that's not just the name of the person that died. Anyone that might be listed in their obituary is counted as one of the names, which is why the collection is so large. Um, this collection, if you read in the about area, this is the result of web crawling. Okay, so they're essentially doing Google searches for obituaries as newspapers, <clears throat> like our local Buffalo News or the Gazette, things like that, they post online. Ancestry's little web crawlers gets out and snatches those obituaries and makes an index of them. So if you see here, the file that might come up would look like this, but it's just a transcription of the information. I can save the transcription to my tree. You know, and it says that Leah Gullwitzer, she was a female, she resided in Grand Island, her death date, the obituary date, the newspaper, her spouse, um, children, and siblings. So their web crawlers picked all that information out and gave it to me. But it's not showing me the actual record. If you scroll down, Ancestry always scroll down. That's advice, okay? So if you scroll down and you go to the source citation, you see that URL? Copy it. Paste it. See what happens. And you may get to the place where the obituary was um, originally published. Now, in this case, the obituary was removed. But scroll down, and I found um, the, the guest memorials that people posted were still there. And you can start to build on um, that family tree and that fan club, your friends, associates, and, uh, associates and neighbors. You know, like Sally and family, sorry to read about your mom's passing. So I know that the person that they're talking about was um, Sally's mom and things like that. So you can deduce that from there. So that's a great record collection, and that's on your handout. Another um, one that popped up for me, this record collection comes up as those shaky leaf hints on Ancestry, was it had this name, Helen Margaret Cole, and her spouse, Robert, and her children, Robert. So I went and I clicked on Review, and, you know, again, what I can add to the tree is just that transcription. But if you look, there's that URL. Copy and paste it. And I found the full obituary full of details about Robert, um, including his picture, which then I was able to put on my tree to help honor him in the family tree for generations to come so that they can see um, what he looked like. And so that was from that shaky hint, but just scroll down and copy-paste that um, URL. I also saved the um, PDF of the obituary and put it on there, too. Um, the uh, Polish, can you say it, Al? Jenny Dwabyszewski's. What he said, um, <laughs> the Everybody's Daily from Buffalo has been digitized and is now lo located at the, the website, the New York State Historic Newspapers, for free. Um, and so you might find obituaries, um, if you have Polish people, that um, ancestors or family, that they didn't have an obituary in like the Buffalo News or the Courier Express. You know, check that out and see if you can find um, the uh, death notice in there. Um, newspaper. Okay, moving on to funeral home records. I'm not doing bad. I'm kind of impressed. I'm, I'm talking super fast. I hope we're still okay. So, um, I brought a couple of uh, the funeral home records that I have. Am I on camera still? Yes. No, you keep losing me? Keep I'm right here <laughs> for you, know. Don. It keeps going out. Aww. So I don't know what's going Sorry, on. Sorry, Facebook. We love you anyway. Um, so, do any of you guys have these types of um, things that you've collected that people know you're kind of the family historian and so as they're cleaning out attics and basements, um, you get this? These are just wonderful, wonderful things. Um, you never know what you might find inside, such as letters and cards um, uh, telling the story, not only just the names of the people. This is my oldest one. This is um, from 1940. Um, but just the handwriting of your ancestors that have long since gone that might have signed the book um, visiting. The one I have that I really want to share is this one of my um, great-grandfather. This is Ernest, is that great-grandpa? Um, the, the book, unfortunately, the, the front has uh, started to, to break. But right inside, because he passed away in Florida, is a newspaper clipping that um, I don't have because I wasn't checking the Florida newspapers, you know, or maybe they're not online. 
Um, but then it has all the people, um, you know, his, um, his date of birth, um, his children who he was married to, um, you know, the, the parents, where the funeral was held and when, and then um, where he's going to be buried, then all the people that signed it. But then there were separate pages for people in his union. He was an electrician. And so I've seen that a lot. Like firemen, if they were a fireman, they'll sign on a separate page. Um, and so you can see all the people that came to visit. My, my great-grandmother, um, she kept a list of all the cards and letters that she received from people. But then the bonus is underneath. There's a, there's a secret compartment. This is the best. Okay, it says, um, space for flower cards, lift up. What's in here? Okay, there are bulletins from the church from when he passed away and thanking for the flowers or the flowers at the altar. This was a card that she also then wrote down. It says, um, neighbors. So I'm assuming these were neighbors that maybe dropped off casserole dishes or in my head. Um, she got uh, a donation. Um, a contribution to the Salvation Army was made by a person in the, um, the honor of that name. Um, similar uh, cards in here. Um, in deepest sympathy, a card from another person that's in the family. And then she has the, um, the, the cars, the pallbearers, and then who is sitting in each car on their way to the cemetery written out. Um, there's so much information and just, you know, a little note from her daughter, you know, in, in there, or actually, no, I'm sorry, this was her sister. You know, there's just so much that you might find about what happened at that time and who was involved in your family's life um, that would be around, you know, like, and I said, as I said, that fan club, those friends, associates, and neighbors are so important to genealogy research. So if you haven't looked at one of these, like maybe you have it at home and it's been a while since you've looked into it, each time we look at our family tree, we're kind of looking at it with fresh eyes because, you know, we, each, we learn more about our family. We become more um, acquainted with them. And so you might notice something that you didn't notice before. So I encourage you to, to check those out, um, the funeral home records. Inside one of these, I found a letter, um, and it was from, it was signed, um, I am your uncle Frank. So it gave me some help as to who it was. The person um, said where uh, they were writing from, Blasburg, PA, Dear um, Ernest Inez and family, we received a card from Ella saying that your mother has passed from this life, and I'm sending you a few words to express the sympathy and regret which we all feel for you that you had a good mother, there is no room for doubt, and we only have to think of our own to realize what your, um, what yours, your, thoughts, must, your thoughts must be. Um, I guess there is plenty of trouble in store for all of us while here, but there is a consolation in the fact that the troubles and afflictions of the departed are over for all time. We have not heard from any... Um, anyone in Buffalo in a long time, and so we don't have much of an idea of the affairs of our people there, and I don't often write as I am too nervous and shaky to do so. Would like very much to see you and the others there, but if the chances of my ever getting up there again are about 100 to 1, um, as I am in a miserable state of health. However, I will reach the 74-year period of my life on the 16th inst instant this month, See what I did there? Okay. And that, um, and that is not young. And Charlie would have been 71 the next day. And he's talking about his brother, which is my direct ancestor. I think very often of all my people who are gone, but of course that does not change things at all. I will close this by wishing everything um, that is good for you and all, and we will be glad if you can make um, us a visit um, at any time. With love to all, I'm your Uncle Frank. And so what I didn't realize that, so it's helping me put the family tree together. Charles was my great aunt, my second great grandpa, my direct ancestor. This letter's from his brother, and that he said, and Charlie would have been 
um, you know, uh, 70, uh, would have been 71 the next day. Frank's birthday was the 16th of August in 1866. His younger brother, Charles, was the 17th of August. And so, like, that must have been an important thing between the brothers. And I never heard him called Charlie. He was always Charles. And so to hear that familiar thing, you know, familiar um, nickname, and that was located in a letter in one of the funeral books. So you might never know what's in there. Um, look, 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 look at them. Ask to see if anyone has them. Um, finding funeral home records, um, you might you might get some help there. Check the obituary to see if it lists where a funeral home might be. Check the funeral cards to see if they might have the, um, the funeral home listed. Check cemetery records. And then just take an educated guess um, as to where other family, um, where the relatives, what funeral home they use. For Winifred down here, I had no idea what cemetery she was. I had the obituary, I had the date of death. Um, I called Aldrich um, Funeral Home and I said, uh, please know this is not an emergency. I'm just doing genealogy. I just really want to find out where Aunt Winifred was buried. Would you mind looking? And so she um, said, you know what, give me a couple days because those old records are kept off storage. But she did get back to me and, and let me know that she was at Forest Lawn. And so I was able to go visit her grave. So it can't hurt to give it a, a try, um, you know, even if you'd rather, you know, prefer email so that, you know, you're not calling during a service or anything like that. Um, can't hurt to ask. Ancestry has a large collection similar to that big obituary one. Um, this one is 1847 to current. Um, it has 53 million names. Um, from funeral home collection, and again, it's just their web crawlers crawling out, and instead of them searching newspapers, they're searching funeral home websites to see when um, funeral homes put those up. And so, again, you get the same type of thing where um, you can save that portion to your tree, but if you scroll down, there is often a URL where they received it, and you can go to the funeral home where that person um, where their obituary is placed, and then you have the information there. So scroll down. Okay, um, funeral cards. I brought, I don't know where it is. It flew away. Oh, no, here it is. Funeral cards. Um, they started um, being used in the 17th century, and they became very popular in the 19th century. Um, from what I read online was that you know, newspapers weren't always printed, you know, like before the funeral was going to take place. So a way for them to let people know about the passing is to take a funeral card and it's almost like an invitation for you to attend the funeral. And if a person was more prominent, you weren't allowed in unless you had your card um, to attend that, that funeral. Um, so these have been saved for hundreds and hundreds of years. And um, they have, some places have been scanning them and putting them on. Um, you might want to check out genealogytoday.com, ancestorsatrest.com. I believe these are on the handout. And then Cindy's List has um, a funeral uh, card area on her site, too. And I wanted to kind of throw it out there that if you have funeral cards, and I know you do, if you wouldn't mind making a copy for us, we have vertical files, and I'm sorry the picture's in black and white, I couldn't find the color one, um, that we could put, you know, if you have someone that um, is attached to Niagara County somehow, um, we would love copies of your funeral cards to add to our vertical files. Um, you can, you know, take picture of it and, and email it to us, you can scan it. If you wanted to bring them in, we can make copies on our Xerox machine upstairs during our library hours. Um, you know, share, share with them to help preserve them. Because if you only have it at your house and the house burns down, you've lost that. So providing a copy with us, you know, may well help preserve your family tree. So pinky swear, everyone. We're going to share our funeral cards with me. Okay. Um, so if you want to email them to us, uh, we'd really appreciate it. Um, and then we can help build our library and help other genealogists that come visit our library. And come visit our library. We're open Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays, 1 to 5, <laughs> upstairs. Okay. Um, if any of you guys subscribe to 
uh, the Legacy Family Tree webinars. Um, there's, uh, they just hit their 1,000th webinar this past week. And one of the ones that I thought was really good was this one called Funeral Homes and Family History. Um, the presenter's name is Dan Earl, and I actually learned he's like a ninth or 10th cousin, so, you know, it must run in the family. Um, but uh, it's a really, his dad was a funeral home director, and it's really interesting to hear um, about it from a genealogist's point of view. So check that out. Um, and I, I wasn't, you could do like whole presentation on this. In fact, we will have a whole presentation on church records next year in 2020. But church, church records do list um, deaths and burials. Oh, no, there we go. Um, you, I often find them on Family Search. You can go to search and then their catalog. And then I do a search by place. A lot of my family lived in Buffalo, so if I put Buffalo in there, these are all the collections collections that Family Search has in their card catalog. And if you look, they have 92 collections of church records. So a lot of different churches, they've microfilmed those old books where you might find the baptisms, um, marriages, and then deaths. Um, and so you can look for your ancestors in there. If it has a lock um, above the camera, you have to go to a family history center or a, um, a library affiliate, or you have to be a member of the church. There's a couple um, available, um, Lewiston Library is an affiliate, and the Maple Road um, Family History Center, um, you can do it there. But then if you have a camera that doesn't have a lock, you can feel free to um, click on that from home. I found this one from Lancaster, it says um, in Latin, so I had to, as best as I could, use Google Translate. and. <laughs> and transcribe it. On April 26, Michael Hetzel found dead by the roadside on the way back from the nearby town of Union Road in Chictawaga. Now, I don't know Chictawaga that much, but I've been reassured there's no big water sources along Union Road. So I'm intrigued by this. I don't know. Um, so when I had a day off, I did go down there, and again, for one dollar, <laughs> I was able to get a copy of his death certificate but unfortunately, the informant on this was the coroner. And so for the parents' names, it does say unknown, unknown. And it does say accidental drowning. My family were drinkers on that side. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe the Buffalo River. I, I don't know. I, and there's no newspaper <laughs> article. I, it, so I'm a little stuck on this one at this point. But um, he was young. He was 36, <clears throat> I believe. He, he had a wife. He was 1901. So... Yeah. Yeah, if anyone figures it out, please let me know. Okay, you might also find the church um, located in cemetery records. Um, if you um, get the uh, cards or if you get to look in the old books, the uh, churches um, are sometimes listed. Um, and then that can lead you to the microfilm where you can find um, the death records in there. Okay, moving quickly, I'm just touching on these things. Um, family Bibles, um, a lot of times um, there were some, some pages in a family Bible where the births, marriages, and deaths were recorded. Um, some of those um, have been donated to various institutions, um, you know, historical societies, genealogical societies. The, where I got this one, they were super nice, and they even sent me a transcription along with it um, to help me understand the names that were going on with that. So ask around where your family lived and see if... Uh, and what happens to have, you know, if you visit a repository like ours or something, you could be like, hey, do you have any Bible records? Maybe we do. Cemetery records are another place for us to find deaths. Um, our library upstairs has a, a great number of local um, cemetery books. Um, Shelley, in fact, wrote two of them, right, on St. Patrick's, um, and is working on a book for Glenwood. Would you like to tell them a little... Bit about submitting stories to you? Yeah, yeah. Actually, um, I'm writing a book on Glenwood Cemetery, people who reside from there in the history of the cemetery. Publishing it sometime probably late uh, summer, early fall next year. I'm looking for stories from people. Um, if you think you might know somebody who has a story or you have a story, see me and I'll, I'll tell you where you can send that. Great. Thank you. Um, Cemeteries, the larger cemeteries like Forest Lawn, they actually even have a separate building 
where they have um, copies of their old records and you can um, share your stories of the ancest of your ancestor that's buried there. You can um, enter the information on the computer system that they have to help preserve that record uh, for generations to come. Next. Um, cemetery records sometimes come in individual cards or they can also come in a family plot card. These are usually very helpful um, when not everyone has a headstone. So that can help you even though it says the date of burial, um, you know, you can, it, it'll help you at least narrow down when the date of death was. Okay. Um, uh, we're running low on time. I'm going to skip those. Yep. This is a favorite website of mine that I use, um, Ancestor Search. It's a tombstone birthday calendar or calculator. Do you ever have a tombstone that said this person lived 78 days, you know, or 78 years, nine months, and three days, and it has their date of death, and you're like, ah. um, this will calculate it for you so you can find their date of birth. Um, so this is just the neatest little uh, tombstone calculator. I have used it for years. Um, and it, I love because it, it'll calculate in like the leap years and, and everything like that. So tombstone birthday calculator. Do a Google search, it'll just come up. The website is searchforancestors.com. Okay, coroner's reports. Um, again, I watched a webinar on Legacy Family Tree webinars by Lisa Alzo. It's called Cause of Death Using Coroner's Records for Genealogy. And I was curious about it. Um, so I went to the Niagara County Clerk's website, and um, they, they do have a um, re request for release of autopsy report. And I, so I went over there, and I found the woman, and I asked her, I'm like, well, I'm a genealogist. I'm giving a presentation on death records. Can, can someone come in and, and get a copy of this? And she looked at me like I was quite ghoulish. Um, you know, and that, why would anyone want to read that and, and everything? And no, their records are closed. Um, you are not, you know, only the next of kin can get the autopsy report um, and certainly not the coroner's notes. Um, so that's Niagara County. Um, but do check the local newspapers because I, from what I understand, sometimes the coroner would give like reports within like a newspaper column. Like not not the you know what I mean, but just a listing of the, who he did or, um, who the person did autopsies on. Um, but Erie County is a little bit looser. For um, the bargain price of forty dollars, <laughs> uh, you can sure get um, a coroner's report. And actually, um, if you read the fine print, if you are a, a dis, like the next of kin, um, you the forty dollar fee is waived. I put I was the second great granddaughter and I got it for free. Um, I didn't have to pay the $40. Now, I only put the top on here. It really isn't that bad. I thought I would pass it around if you guys would like to read it. And if you don't, you just pass it to the next person. Um, my second great grandfather um, got hit. Um, he was a conductor on the railroad. And so it explains a little bit about that. So I will pass that to you. The death certificate is on the back. And the reason why I knew to ask for a coroner's report is because on the death certificate, it says, was an autopsy re performed? And it said yes. So sometimes those records might include some family information or more information about the person. You don't know until you look. We're getting close. We're getting close, I promise. So um, please use wills and probate to help find death records. Sometimes those were kept before the town or wherever it was kept the records themselves. You might be able to find a probate. Um, they often will help list the children um, where they're living at the time um, of the person's death to help settle their estate. This one is my favorite. Um, it's my third great grandfather. This was his will signed in 1881. I know I've shared this with you guys. I got to hold it. Um, this was signed before they kept death dates. So I found it in his probate file. It's the only record of his death because he lived in Elma and they didn't keep dates until like 83 and he died in 1882. So please check wills and probates. And I'm skipping those. Um, if you're trying to figure out when a person died, try creating a timeline. I was using directories and if you look in the left-hand column, 
The address was 605 Michigan, and in 1871, George was an upholsterer, and Michael worked as a sleuth. And then the next year, in 1872, George was there, and then a Margaret was widowed because Michael passed away. So, you know, use directories to help you find clues. Um, it can also be listed, you know, just widowed, you know, Frank on there. Um, if you're looking at marriage certificates, look to see if a person's indicating that this is their second marriage. Therefore, first, you know, if it says widowed, first wife passed away or first husband passed away. Um, it can be located in church records. And this one, I was told the Latin for, I guess it's defuncti, means that he's previously passed. Um, there's mortality censuses from 1850 to 1880. We've done um, census records here before, um, but the one year prior to the 1850-1880 ones, um, or is that right, 1860, 78, I think it's 30 years, um, you might find someone listed in the mortality census, and you might find um, deaths located in county histories, um, so you can look there. Um, on land records, on maps, if it says EST, like the estate, you can find it again in land records. If the estate is settling the deed of the property, that could help you narrow down a death date. And we did it. One hour, 21 minutes. Okay. So, <laughs> thank you so much, everyone. Please.